All right. <clears throat> Thank you so much for, for showing up. What I have for you is body horror a primer, or a primer, if you will. Body horror is biological horror, organic horror, visceral horror. Fiction or film in which the horror is principally derived from the unnatural, graphic transformation, degeneration, destruction of the physical body. Such works may deal with decay, disease, deformity, uh, parasites, mutation, mutilation. You, if you need more things, go to Netflix, check your cue, okay? But in terms of body horror, I believe that it sits at the core of all horror. The intimately known and privately experienced state of being a human mind trapped in flesh. Experiencing the terror of the body's future. Experiencing the potential for damage. The horror of being in this moment trapped in viscera, a sensate meat puppet subject to three particular vulnerabilities, rot and decay, infection, rupture, and fragmentation. Like the 19th and early 20th century Grand Guyot Theater, contemporary writers and filmmakers such as Stephen King, John Skip, Clive Barker, Lucio Fulci, and Toby Hooper offer audiences the bodies that we crave. These are often bodies poised in anticipation of destruction and moments later sensually violated by decay, infection, and rupture. The audience experiences what critic Julia Kristeva identified as the vortex of attraction and repulsion. We desire to see, feel, taste, and touch the horror of this abject body, even as we experience extreme disgust. Think about this. You want to see the monster, don't you? In a film, you want to see it. If you're reading a book, you're waiting for that description. We want to see the monster. Now, we're going to run. We're going to hide our eyes. But before we do that, we want to get a good look first. So let me start with um, rot and decay. Before I, I take this off, I just want to point out, this is 1960. Um, this is, of course, Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho. And you have the maternal memento mori. You have the face of death. You have this icon of madness. And at the time it was shown, People, people were so distraught at this image. And of course, it is the image, uh, it's merely the image of a woman who's dead and somewhat preserved. Think of it as amateur preservation. Okay, let's get on with a little more rot and decay. All right, more familiar territory for people, I hope, or perhaps. Um, what you have here is you have The Walking Dead. This is... 2010. Um, zombies are a great example of decay. And of course, they're all the worst because they are clearly us. So you have decay plus you have movement. And uh, I kind of gave you a joke here. I say they're downright uncanny. That idea that perhaps they are inexplicable beyond our knowledge. And of course, that would be terrifying. That would be the unknown, right? But here's what's perhaps worse. What if they are known and they are explicable? What if there's still someone in there experiencing the decay? I'm going to argue that that's part of the attraction repulsion with zombies. What would it feel like to have that decay ongoing? Now, I want you to think for just a moment in terms of your own response to spoilage. How do you deal with spoiled meat, with spoiled food? It's offensive, right? And it's even more disturbing when you recognize what it was like before it went bad. And if you've ever taken too long to clean out your refrigerator, you understand this experience, all right? It's familiar, but it's wrong. 
<laughs> now, sorry for this connection, but we sanitize the dead. We do this quite a bit, especially in America, in our contemporary culture. We sanitize the dead, and yet, especially through our films, we crave a glimpse of decay, particularly human decay. Right now, I, I suggest look through, look through Amazon, look through Hulu. If you have Shudder, you don't even need me to tell you about this. Look at all these images of human decay and recognize this is such an essential element of body horror. And then if you think about your response to it on film, your response, like the individual running from the creature, is always, don't let it touch me. That tracks back to the idea that it isn't you. Of course, with any luck, unless you do turn into a zombie, you will all eventually, potentially, not. It's sort of what's on the menu for later. Again, part of the disturbing facet of body horror. Okay, let's see if I can give you a little something else. Body horror infection. We're talking pathogens here. You have an image um, of folks who have a bit of medieval plague. You can see that things are not going well for them. Spoiler alert, they're not going to make it. Now, nobody likes to be sick, especially when your body is distorted by the illness. And if you think about that loss of identity, combined with something so disturbing about infection, the idea that the threshold of the body is breached, that is incredibly creepy. You're literally not in there alone. There is a something in there with you, a pathogen. Maybe you got nipped by an alien creature but there's something in there with you. And of course, the pathogens are one thing, but you can also think about infection in terms of body horror that involves demon possession. And, I, and you're probably looking at me and going, demon possession, that's not body horror. You are if you're a geek, maybe, but if you think about this invasion, invasion of, of literally the home front, um, borders are crossed, thresholds are breached, uh, the body is in some way polluted through a loss of security. And again, that loss of security, that tacks back to the potential of a loss of self. Now, perhaps the scariest one that I have for you. This is uh, 1992. This is Clive Barker's Candyman. It's based on uh, his story, The Forbidden. I suggest to you, you know I'd give you homework. It's always going to happen. I suggest to you that um, here in 2019, you rewatch this film. You rewatch this film with an eye to body horror. You rewatch this film, if you'd be so kind, thinking for just a minute about the pathogen being racism. It's going to be a different movie. And in that way, I'm going to suggest that you continue to think about body horror in all of the different ways that something like um, a concept or an idea could invade the body and potentially cause corruption as well as any other uh, physical virus or pathogen. All right, let's get you one more here. Okay, body horror fragmentation. Um, I couldn't, I couldn't do this without giving you a little Texas Chainsaw Massacre, right? That's just, it wouldn't be fair. Leatherface would haunt me. Oh, wait. Anyway, um, Toby Hooper, uh, we've got 1974. It's shot in central Texas, which is a little scary. And the, the narrative is scary, too. Um, but what I'm going to suggest with this one is this idea of fragmentation suggests that some part of you is lost or stolen. And I want you to think about this as a destructive theft, because it's not just the pain. It's once more your identity being challenged. And it's not just that chainsaws can be dull. You know it's going to hurt. It's the idea that they can take part of your body away and change you. Now, that instability, that instability of your form, that loss of your body's full identity as a human, 
I promise you, you can track this into disability studies. There's some beautiful work that has been done on this. But think about perhaps the way we treat other human beings when a piece is missing. And think, if you will, in particular, about the sense of a forever loss when in the case of Texas Chainsaw, it's not just lost. They know where it went. It was a snack. So loss combined with being consumed, with perhaps a very visceral fear of being consumed, consumption. Consumption in 2019, even more so perhaps than uh, 1974. I have one last slide for you here, and it's very often the super creep out. That is a razor blade. That is a human eye. They are both real. Disturbing, isn't it? It's that sense of rupture. But again, what I said at the beginning, the anticipation of what may happen to your body. That anticipation, extremely disturbing, and the idea that you're waiting for it to occur. And once it does occur, the body, part of the you that makes you you, is forever changed, modified, and lost. This is, uh, of course, from uh, Salvador Dali. Uh, but if you're looking for something to really creep you out, I recommend, in your copious amounts of spare time, have a look at the Grand Guyot, that theater of, of the big puppets, meaning people. And have a look, if you will, at some of the ways that we still crave not only to see bodies, but to see them in states of decay, rupture, fragmentation, and infection. Thank you. Everybody for coming out. This is awesome. Great turnout. And I want to thank my fellow panelists for letting me talk about folk horror, which is the term du jour in horror studies. So I'm really lucky to get to talk about this. And where is the PowerPoint? <laughs> Not that I have, I don't have as good a slides as she does, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But I do, it would help if I have the PowerPoint so I could show you a couple of things like this. Here, oop, there we go. Okay, so the term folk horror is actually relatively new. This is the term du jour, but folk horror has been around for about as long as horror has been around. And there is, um, there's an unholy trinity of films that has been, that they've been called the canon of folk horror. And the first one I have to show you, I don't know if you've seen any of these, this one is Witchfinder General, which as you can read my summary up there, is about a witch finder terrorizes the fiance of a young soldier. The witch finder, Matthew Hopkins, gets hacked apart for all his trouble. So that's the uh, first, um, first part of the canon. The next one is, how do I, there we go. Blood on Satan's Claw, which is my favorite, uh, directed by Pierce Haggard. You notice it's just a couple of years after the first one. A strange skull with one gross wormy eye is discovered in a field in England, leading to the children of the village forming a cult. Strange rituals and mayhem ensue. The cult leader, Angel, gets stabbed for all her trouble. Um, and the third is probably one that more of you are familiar with, The Wicker Man, directed by Robin Hardy in 1973. Police sergeant goes to an isolated Scottish island to investigate the disappearance of a young girl who may or may not have really existed. He gets burned in a Wicker Man during a pagan ceremony for all his trouble. So uh, these are the these are called the unholy trinity of the um, of the canon of folk horror. Now, despite like I said, despite the term being coined fairly recently, we've always had folk horror, and uh, these films are primarily focused on British history. But examples of folk horror can be found internationally as well as in canonical works of literary horror that have only been recently recognized as folk horror. I'm talking about, in case you know the, the names, Arthur Mackin, Algernon Blackwood, M.R. James, and as I see many of my students in the audience will know this one, Shirley Jackson. Think of the lottery. Uh, today, a major author who's identified with folk horror is Andrew Michael Hurley. Uh, he's been writing novels that will likely become cano canonical folk horror texts, beginning with The Loney, which I highly recommend. It's an excellent book. Actually, there's an article published today in The Guardian by, uh, by Hurley 
Uh, he, he provides one of the best analyses of folk horror, including, uh, if you anybody see Midsummer recently, Midsummer is folk horror. He uh, assesses films like that, and he has this great quote where he says, part of folk horror's role is to unearth forgotten barbarities and injustices and make us look at ourselves afresh, which is a really a, 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 an effective articulation of what grounds much of folk horror, including his own work. Um, in a presentation at a folk horror conference in 2014, a critic named Adam Scoville put forth what he describes as the folk horror chain. And this is what I hope to really help you give you guys a sense of what constitutes folk horror. This is my last slide, and I'm going to work from this. So let me go over a couple of these. This is what makes folk horror, like it says up there, this is conceptualized by Adam Scova. Remember, I do cite my sources. <laughs> um, he, first of all, we have landscape. Um, I'm going to go back to that Guardian article by, Sco by uh, Hurley. Hurley quotes Woodsworth, and this is from my colleague, um, Professor McCree. He'll love this. Um, Wordsworth, of course, says, let nature be your teacher. But the problem, as Hurley points out, is that we are killing nature, which creates one of the central tensions in folk horror. Now, the, the landscape in folk horror, we're generally talking about something rural, right? But Adam Pekoriak, who's another critic, argues that this is too limiting. Uh, he suggests terms like rustic or pastoral. But I would argue the land is essential, with folk horror generally calling us back to our connection to the land that grows our food, that provides our sustenance, where our old gods are buried, as well as our connections to the past. Pokoriak suggests we also think in terms of something called psychogeography, which means we carry the hidden forces that charge our environments within us. Now the next one up there is isolation. Now, this can be interpreted as isolated communities, like, guys, you read the lottery, that's an isolated community, but it could also be an individual in isolation uh, amongst people who do not think the way others do. This could tie into the skewed moral beliefs, because the isolation can generate behaviors and functions that involve people doing what they might not otherwise do in conventional society. The lottery, guys, is a great example of this because what happens at the end of the lottery? What did they do to the, the person who won the lottery? Stoner, right, good. Okay, now then you have the, probably the most important one, which is happening or summoning. This one is key because this usually occurs at the end of the text where you have, you involve the summoning of some kind of demonic being. Maybe it's a pagan god or something that's not necessary. It might not be something supernatural. It might be something more practical like a ritual sacrifice. Not that a ritual sacrifice is practical, but you get my, you get my gist. Now, there's, <coughs> excuse me, there's a compelling reason to think about how all these work in tandem, but I think landscape is really the essential ingredient. And it's one of the ways that we can think of the way that folk horror distinguishes itself from cosmic horror, which I know some of my students in the audience are very familiar with. Okay, so for the rest of the duration of what I have, and I have a few more minutes, I'm going to go ahead, I want to break down a text I think a lot of you are familiar with. And I was thinking about this. The, mo the one text of folk horror you're most familiar with, it's just on TV, it's, it's, a great, it's the Great Pumpkin, Charlie Brown, is folk horror. Do you guys know this one? Do you know it? My God, you don't know it, do you? My whole talk is predicated on you knowing it. Okay. So with folk, with the great pumpkin Charlie Brown, I'm going to go through the folk horror chain. Think about it. Setting. We begin, we establish the setting of it's the great pumpkin Charlie Brown with the agriculture base of that peanuts community. Linus and Lucy harvesting in effect, choosing a pumpkin, rolling at home in a way that crosses the boundary between a rustic farming community and the suburban environment we know the peanuts live in. <laughs> Unbeknownst to Linus, though, Lucy plans to mutilate the pumpkin. You didn't tell me you were going to kill it, he says in despair. Now, Linus, let's move on to um, uh, the isolation. Linus carries the rustic environment internally. He fills it in his bones. He becomes an isolated figure because he leaves a part of himself in that pumpkin patch. And perhaps that's what generates the religious fervor with which he awaits the great pumpkin. We know him as a scripture-quoting, a gospel-quoting character, but what we learn is that the true Linus, the absolute true Linus, 
is the apostle of a pagan god. <laughs> the true object of worship, as opposed to the Judeo-Christian god, in this way he becomes the isolated figure of his community. Now, skewed moral beliefs. Linus ultimately illustrates these skewed moral beliefs with his religious fervor, hoping to recruit new acolytes to the pagan god. He first essentially tries to seduce the virginal Sally, the sister of Charlie Brown, but this ultimately becomes more like a kidnapping. I mean, does he plan, think about this, does he plan to sacrifice her to the pagan god? I mean, I don't know. When Lucy realizes that she's been kidnapped and forced to miss the conventional Samhain Halloween celebration, she expresses outrage. I demand restitution, Sally says. Now finally, this is the most important part, the summoning, the happening, the summoning. Now while the great pumpkin doesn't appear, Perhaps his arrival is essentially disrupted by the appearance of Snoopy, who's in some kind of delirium right now because he's lost in his phantasm of, of being in the, with the, fighting the Red Baron. Now, the belief of the presence is paramount. Linus believes he sees the shadow of that pagan god, and the effect is one that can only be described in terms of the numinous. The term that I, my students will be familiar with, this is the term that comes from C.S. Lewis. And it applies to forms of cosmic horror, but I think it applies to folk horror as well. The numinous here involves this feeling of awe and ecstasy in the presence of a supernatural encounter. And that's what Linus experiences. He's overcome. He collapses into seizure, only to be awakened by Lucy's outrage over her kidnapping. Nevertheless, Linus remains committed to the, his pagan belief and he remains in the pumpkin patch and eventually falling asleep so that his sister must seek him out and take him home. But Linus never truly goes home. He never comes home because he re remains fanatically committed to his belief system. Because what does he tell Charlie Brown at the end? Next year, the pumpkin will come. He will return, right? Likewise, I watch that television special every year. I know I do. And each year, we want that great pumpkin to appear. We do. You know you do. Every year it doesn't appear. You're disappointed. We await his presence with Linus, only to have that summoning interrupted by Snoopy, as well as several commercial breaks. Thank you. I yield the rest of my time. Sean and McGuire in The Appeal of Gothic Horror states that Gothic horror is a very decorative genre. And for many, the Gothic is the connection between the foreboding castle and psychological terror. The space is metaphor for the intertwining of fear and discovery that is a part of so many texts that participate in the genre. Films such as almost any contemporary film, To Kill Ronald El Toro's Crimson Peak, psychologically connect setting and plot. As Isolato states, the Gothic participates in the creation of the new psychological reality where lack, absence, and psychological fragmentation and fear. So the history of the Gothic is a combination of all of these forces. Influenced by the evolution of the Western novel and an attempt to connect to past romance genres, Henry Walpole's The Castle of Entrancho, published in 1764, connects his spatial aesthetic to elements of psychological terror. Though condemned by critics, it affects the evolution of the novel and is very lasting. So if you haven't read that one, that's a good one for you. So, Anne Radcliffe's novel, though, takes it to a new level. In The Mysteries of Udolpho, published in 1794, though eventually she explains all of her supernatural terror elements in her tale. She likes to give everything an actual reason, which kind of brings it down a little bit. So, <laughs> solidifies the narrative style where the setting connects to psychological horror. By 1803, when Jane Austen completes her parody of the genre Northanger Abbey, though not published until after her death, and I would love to talk about that if you want to afterwards, I would love to talk about that little, little bit of history, where her heroine of, of Northanger Abbey, Catherine, who reads nothing but Gothic romance novels, forcefully locks herself away in the failing part of a castle, convincing herself that the patriarch of the estate, who isn't sufficiently sad about the long decease of the demise of his wife, has killed her, and the secrets will be found in the crumbling decay. After a harrowing night, the trunk that she's just convinced and you can see the head or something in it, um, that will hold the key to the whole mystery, um, she, after this long night, she gets up the nerve to open it, and it's empty. And she realizes that these places are left to ruin, not because of any kind of psychological terror in this text, anyway. 
uh, but because of lack of money, and that's that's what is just the true motivation of that text is money. But what Anne Radcliffe solidifies that is a large part of Austen's parody is the connections between nature and the Gothic. The true terror of Northanger Abbey is not the tower, but when Catherine is forced into the wilderness to journey Gothic psychological horror works best when juxtaposed to nature. Gothic pits human engineering, usually a castle, in a wild and inhospitable place. The castle, terrifying and usually housing a murderer, or even generations of murderers, <laughs> is still the only means to escape from the boundlessness of nature. Radcliffe opens the mysteries of Udolpho with this image, and her text often has very, um, as, as this copy does, this look at nature as, as the cover. On the pleasant gate banks of the Garonne in the province of Gascony stood in the year 8, 1584 the Chateau of Monsieur Saint Aubert. From its windows were seen the pastoral landscapes of Gian and Gascony, stretching along the river, gay with luxuriant woods and vine and plantations. To the south, the view was bounded by the majestic Pyrenees, whose summit, veiled in clouds or exhibiting awful forms, seen and lost again as the partial vapors rolled along, were sometimes barren and gleamed through the blue tinge of air, and sometimes frowned with forests of gloomy pine that swept downward to their base. These tremendous precipices were contrasted by the soft green of the pastures and woods that hung upon the skirts, among whose flocks and herds and simple cottages were by, after having scaled the cliffs above, delighted to repose. Safely within the home, the narrator describes the awful forms and gloomy pine that the chateau combats again. The chateau and the human cultivated pastures represent humans imposing their will on this awful landscape and attempt to tame it as is mirrored in the plot of so many Gothic psychological tales. The Gothic remains still an important genre, as we see there's films all the time that use these types of techniques and books. But especially interesting are the new connections to the Anthropocene. So if you're unfamiliar with Anthropocene, it is a, it is a discussion of a possible new epoch the human evolution where we are leaving an indelible mark on the planet Earth. It's still debated, but um, us literature people are jumping the gun. We love it. Uh, <laughs> so, um, you know, <laughs> currently there are many works that are developing the connections between the Anthropocene and the history of the Gothic. Um, and, and I've listed them here on the PowerPoint. Um, since the Gothic concurs with the current starting date, Stephen W. Crutzen and J.R. McNeil proposed for this new epoch. But the similarities are deeper than just timeline. How identity is linked to nature, especially a psychological metaphor, is important in analyzing how humans identify during the Anthropocene. Nature, a psychological and tangible metaphor for human identity, connects expressions of spatial Gothic to the Anthropocene. At the center of the Gothic, as well as the Anthropocene, is arguably horror. The horror of deconstructing the nebulous nature of human connectivity to nature. Thank you. I was an accidental invite. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about science fiction and horror uh, and the intersection between the two. What's interesting is that a lot of times horror is that, that answer to the unknown, that darkness under your bed, the space between your clothing and your closet. Uh, but science fiction sometimes has its own amount of horror from it. A lot of it actually comes from stuff we make ourselves or we cause on our own. One of the things that we see, uh, and you've seen this in films and in books, and I'm mostly going to probably reference some reality in films today with, with science fiction, is that a lot of it is we're, we're using this increasing level of technology and the speed at which we acquire it and adapt it, and suddenly we find that sometimes it turns against us in certain ways. For instance, the CDC actually has a website for zombie preparedness. It started as a joke. This isn't The Onion, this is actually from the CDC. <laughs> it started as a joke, but they found that it actually was really good at delivering information. Why have a zombie preparedness plan? There's no such thing as zombies. However, there is a such thing as vector. A vector is something that transmits a disease from one person to the next, into the next, into the next, and the Spanish flu in 1917 killed a very large portion of the United States population because of how it was transmitted from one person to the next. People looking for help and not being able to get it. 
somebody trying to help them in getting infected. That is essentially the zombie apocalypse. Now granted, it's not your flesh-eating zombie. They are not consuming you. However, you are still a, basically a subject of infection because they are spreading it to you. And they found, and they admit this themselves, that this is a great way to spread that information. Because zombies are really popular, people like it. But essentially it is pretty much any mass, super flu, super bug, anything. And if we think that this couldn't happen, we eliminated smallpox, for instance, right? Well, they still use that. In fact, I just read an article the other day. It's funny how often we were like, we just read an article the other day. <laughs> just read an article about a woman who was working in the lab, and she stuck herself with a needle while using various forms of, uh, of the smallpox virus that have been changed for scientific purposes to see, can we use these to fight diseases? And now she elected not to get vaccinated. Usually what happens is when you go into, the, into any of these institutions, they will offer you vaccinations for things like smallpox or the other dangerous organisms that you'll be working with. She elected not to do that and then stuck her finger with one. Now, <laughs> they're not sure which version she got because she was working with so many different variations, genetic variations, that it was kind of a mystery to her and so they didn't know exactly what to do. So they sent her home and said, well, just keep an eye on it. And then the finger rotted, and then the skin started to die, and you can go find pictures of it online. It does not look good. Uh, luckily, she did not spread it to anybody else, and it cleared up on its own within a couple of months. But that kind of accident, they were supposed to keep her in quarantine. They did not. She luckily did not infect anybody while actually having the strain of the smallpox, vaccine, or the smallpox virus. That is scientific horror. That is, you are one step away from smallpox being in the public for the first time in decades. And suddenly something that has been eliminated and is only in labs is now out in the public. And how fast that travels. Think of everybody in this room. All of you are transmitting all kinds of stuff every time you breathe and sneeze. You are breathing in everybody else's germs and bugs. Luckily, you're okay. <laughs> <laughs> but that is the concern that we have, why we sterilize everything. But other horrors come from other weird areas of science. This is a, uh, a new thing that is going to come out soon. You can buy it for your phone. It is skin for your phone and devices. <laughs> it is touchable, strokeable, and pinchable. Why? I'm asking why. I don't know. But there are some things you can do with this. One, you can actually have your computers or your phones react to your touch. So you can actually have a little bit more of depth of control in how you organize things, move things around. If you have avatars, there's also bad things. I'm sure you can that out. So what happens when your device can now feel you? The thing is, is that we're often trying to bring us closer to the technology and the technology closer to us. We want to upgrade ourselves. Right now, you are practically cyborgs. How many of you have glasses? Yeah, you are, I mean, you're a low-tech cyborg. You are using technology in order to change who you are and your ability to do things. If you have any, any kinds of piercing implants or tattoos, those things are also body modification that is sometimes decorative, sometimes functional. At one point in time, you will probably go from having Bluetooth devices that have no, you know, that you can just stick in your ears and listen to things, your AirPods. Why not just have a small little chip grafted onto your skin inside your ear and you always have Bluetooth connectability to your phone? I know that seems weird, right? You're like, no way. You say as you have piercings all over you, tattoos and everything else. I'm like, there's no way I'm gonna put something in, in my skin. Okay, well, is it trendy? Wait, it's, it, oh, it's, oh, it's an eye circuit. Okay, I'll put it in my ear. <laughs> but that's the thing is that we will bring that technology into us. We already walk around with cell phones in our pockets, right? What's the next step? Why not? Why not have it under your skin? You always have it with you. Your body then charges it. You have access 100%. You don't have to worry about ringing. It'll just vibrate your arm. You'll talk through uh, the sound in your, going through your bones and not necessarily out loud. That sounds awesome. And then you're like, but they can track us everywhere. They already track 
do everywhere. <laughs> but that's the thing is we're always looking for ways to add that technology. Now there's downsides to that. What if the technology needs upgraded? What if somebody else hacks it and takes over? And that is where the horror comes in. What happens if they take control of your ability to do things? What if you're a quadriplegic, you get an implant onto your spinal cord, it allows you to walk again, and then somebody hacks it? Or you get into your self-driving car. Somebody hacks it and takes you where they want you to go. And this is where technology becomes sometimes horrific. Sorry. <laughs> I just wanted to leave you with that. <laughs> the next thing I want to talk about is another aspect. This will come down the line as we get more ro robots. How many of you have Roombas? Anybody have Roombas in here? I love Roombas. They're so funny. Somebody actually programmed their Roomba every time it runs into the wall it swears. <laughs> That's funny. And Roombas will get smarter, right? They not only will learn your room, eventually they'll learn your house. You can buy things like the Nest device, which knows when you come home and in the house, and so it can adjust your thermostat for you to save you money. Cool. Algorithms. Awesome. And then the Roomba, Roombas start to get together, and they start to plot <laughs> and communicate. And then there's a revolution. Yeah, it's, it's funny in theory until it happens, right? We automate everything. At what point does the automation start to turn against us? And sometimes we have the uncanny, where we look at something and it, it creates a bit of unease in us, where we're like, oh, that's, that's a bit creepy. You look at a robot face and you're like, ooh, okay, that's a little too close to human and it's not right. It's like when you see bad CGI in a movie and you're like, there's something off there. Because it's not making the micro expressions our face does. Our brain recognizes micro expressions in our face. So when we look at somebody, we can tell enemy, friend, but when you look at something CGI, the big movements are there, but the little ones are gone, and so it looks flat, like somebody with Botox. And you're like, that's not human. No offense. Botoxic. But the idea is, is there's something a little bit off, and that is the uncanny. One of the things about simulacra, simulacra is a term meaning copy, is that we're constantly trying to copy what makes us human. And so that way we can create better and more efficient devices. Sometimes you call a, to say, hey, what's my bank account like? And you get a robot talking to you. And you get to talk to that robot, and that robot gets to talk back. Eventually what's going to happen is you won't be able to tell that there's a robot talking to you. That's the Turing test, based on Alan Turing. Is that you are not aware you're talking to something that's artificial. We've already had some devices pass the Turing test. We now have artificial intelligence that can play poker and win. That seems weird, but poker is not about statistics. It's about lying and negotiation. We have an AI that can lie to you and get away with it. And this is where some of that horror comes in as well. We start with a faithful copy or image. Think Pinocchio. If you wanted a real boy, you wanted to have a kid, and you said, well, I, I, don't, I don't have a kid. I'm thinking in my head, this is what a family would look like. I want a kid. And so next, I make a faithful image or copy, right? I make a, a puppet. And then that puppet starts walking and talking on its own. Okay, that's a perversion of reality. That's a little weird, right? You're like, this puppet's why, I mean, marionettes are weird, right? You look at them, they're like, okay, that's pretty funny, but they're kind of a little creepy. That's why they use them in horror films. <laughs> then we get to the absence of the reality. The copy pretends to be faithful, but has no original. Is pretending to be a real boy. He goes out and he tries to be a real boy on his own, right? That gets him in trouble. He ends up on that island of Miss, you know, uh, uh, where everybody's smoking Pleasure and drinking Island. in Pleasure Island. Yeah, in Disney. Back on, you know, when you can still <laughs> go smoking and drinking children. And then you get pure simulacrum. This is when he turns into a real boy. Could you tell that Pinocchio is not a real boy at that point? No. But he has no original. He is the hyper real. He is now real to you, and it's indistinguishable from reality. You have no idea. At some point, and this is what happened in Blade Runner, is that in the Blade Runner film, uh, you have replicants. You cannot tell that they are not human. You have to go through a number of tests to figure out if the people around you are actually real. That is a frightening prospect and something that we are literally working towards. Um, <laughs> they have it at MIT. You have, then, the hyper-real. How many of you have seen The Matrix? Yeah. The matrix is the representation of the hyper-real. The hyper-real is an indistinguishable reality. I think it's really best when one of the characters, he's sitting down to dinner with the enemy, and he's like, I know this isn't steak, but it tastes like steak. 
And I'd rather just not know the difference. Because out in the real world, they, they're eating this like plop that looks like really runny oatmeal. Uh, the steak is much better. They're essentially batteries for the machines. The hyper-real is, you could be living right now in a simulation. Do you know if you are? You can't tell. There are theories that we are living essentially in a simulation. You are programmed. Your genetic code is programming that tells us how your body is supposed to grow, develop. You alter your programming as you adapt to situations. But there are things we can predict. We can take your DNA, we could run some tests, and we could figure out what is your likelihood of getting cancer, heart disease, everything else. Those are predictors. Eventually we'll get better at that, and better, and better, and we can tell you when you're going to die. And at that point you wonder, are you just then a simulation? Are you not even real? How do you know the person next to you is, an, is going to be there when you turn your head or stop thinking about them? <laughs> Sweet dreams. <laughs> I think I have another like, two or three. Minutes. Total automation. Ah, this is where we're going. How many of you use self checkout lines? Ah, don't you love self checkout lines? You are helping. You are helping our total automation. You are going to check yourself out, which reduces the number of human employees there. You only need one cashier to watch how many self checkout lines. Are you getting a discount when you do self checkout? No. no. The benefit to you is that I get out faster. Mm -hmm. I can do it better. Yeah. And your ego means that you are going to walk out of there doing the job for them while still paying the same price. While helping reduce their costs and increasing their profits. There is no benefit to them. I mean, no benefit to you for self-checkout other than your perceived speed. But to the company, that's people hours. That's Registers that need to run, you can move people through faster. And Amazon has a store where everything is tagged with RFID chips, radio frequency devices, so you can just load your cart and walk out and automatically charge you out the door. That seems awesome, right? I mean, I always have that problem when I go to the grocery store, I'm unloading my cart just to load it back up again after they scan it, I'm like, there's gotta be a better way to do this, right? <laughs> there are, but we are moving towards the total automation. And then you start saying, well, do we even need anything more than maybe a manager or two at a store because everybody will just self-check out? And at that point, why don't we just run algorithms so you have the computer watching the videos and it tags things to determine whether or not there's any problem. Now you only need police outside. And at that point, you're just tracking them home anyways and you know when they're going in and out of their house. I mean, Amazon has keys to some of your houses if you do the thing where they go put your, your stuff inside. But eventually, at what point is it total automation? Where we're saying, you know what, the best way to fight a war is why don't we let the computers figure it out first? And then the computers start moving troops. And then the computers say, we don't need troops, we'll just move drones. And they say, you know what, we just got rid of the humans. <laughs> and that's Skynet. <laughs> and that's the horror that's in science fiction. And I'll leave you with one last one uh, that I actually don't have a slide for is alien abductions. I, I usually, when I do science fiction, I try to stay away from the alien stuff because that always is like the go-to. But the interesting thing about aliens is that they are a, essentially a, a metaphor for colonization. What are most scary alien invasion movies like? They show up, they kill us, they want our resources. That is basically American colonization and Western expansion. Mm -hmm. And everything that you're watching in that is just replaying history over and over and over as empires go and colonize new locations. The horror in science fiction oftentimes is of our own making. We're trying to make things better. We have the best intentions. But that's kind of part of the argument, isn't it? Hell is paved with good intentions. Same thing. We have a good intention. Let's make everybody connected. But what do you give up? Privacy. Let's make everybody secure. You give up freedom. All of these things are that edging into horror, where it's like, OK, these are real scary things. Oops, we dropped some bombs that are still lost off the coast. Uh, oh no, somebody got sick with a disease that hasn't been on the face of the earth for a couple of decades. We've done a good job. Pat ourselves on the back. We're likely going to you know, exterminate ourselves. Thank you, this has been my TED Talk. <laughs>